So we're going to move on now to optimization. This is the next application of derivatives that we're going to look at. Um, now, you'll notice that this checklist looks an awful lot like the one for related rates. In fact, a lot of it I've left intact. Uh, the, the main difference between optimization and related rates is um, we're not necessarily looking at quantities that are changing with respect to time anymore. We're going to look at quantities that are related. Um, and, and we're going to look at, you know, how changing, you know, the value of one quantity affects the other in the sense of, you know, something, let's say we're looking at, say, um, finding the best possible price to maximize revenue on a product, right? So revenue is going to be a function of price. We want to determine what we should set the price at to get the, the largest possible revenue, um, this kind of idea, right? Uh, so when we're looking at here, uh, we just have two numbers. Um, we know that they have to sum to 100, and we want to find the largest possible product, right? Um, so typically what happens is that there's two scenarios that, that arise with these, these problems, right? Uh, you might have something like this, where you have two or more quantities, um, and they're related in some way. In this case, the relationship between those quantities is that they sum to 100, okay? And, and, and based on that relationship, we want to figure out what's the largest possible product, right? Or maybe it's some sort of functional relationship, like cost being a function of, or you know, um, revenue being a function of price, something like this, right? Um, but if it is that sort of straightforward functional relationship, we know exactly how to solve the problem, right? We did that in the previous chapter. Um, this is an extreme value problem. We know how to solve that, right? Especially if it's a continuous function on a closed interval, we, we have a process for that. We know what to do, okay? So to, in, in some sense, any of these optimization problems, the goal is to turn it into one of these extreme value problems from the previous chapter, um, and then we just use those methods, right? Now, what tends to happen here is that you've got these different quantities involved and, and different relationships among them, right? Um, so what you have to figure out is, first of all, by reading the problem carefully, what are we actually trying to optimize, right? So in this problem here, we say, what's, what's you know, we look for words like, in this case, largest, right? Largest product. Okay. So, okay, so there's a product. Maybe we call it P. We want to make this as big as possible. Um, and, and it's the product of what? Oh, of two numbers. Maybe we should give these names, right? So maybe we call these numbers X and Y. Okay. So there we go. We got a product. X times Y, we want to make it as big as possible. Okay. So P is the quantity to be optimized here, right? Um, and we, so this is our dependent variable that we want to optimize. Um, and it depends on two independent variables, right? And we, we haven't looked at functions of two or more variables. We only look at functions of a single variable so far. Um, so what do we do, right? We can't yet turn this into that problem of just, you know, take the derivative, set it to zero, check the endpoints in the critical numbers, right? Um, so what do we do? Well, there's one other bit of information that we have here. The numbers have to sum to 100. Um, this is what's known as a constraint, right? Um, so these constraints, we look for these constraints, and what they do is they let us get rid of one of the variables, right? A relationship between the two independent variables means that you can set things up so that one of the two depends on the other, and then you're left with only one, right? So in this case, we know that x plus y has to be equal to 100. And so that means that, for example, we could write y as 100 minus x. And now we have our function of x, right? Therefore, p, and we can even write p of x if we want. p of x is going to be x times 100 minus x, so 100 x minus x squared, right? So there's a function of x we want to optimize, right? And we know how to do that. Uh, now, there is one thing that's missing here, right? We aren't given a domain, right? And, and the problems that we looked at before, we were usually given a continuous function like this one, but often we were also given this closed interval, uh, and there's no interval here. Um, so these optimization problems, these applied problems, often there's this sort of applied domain that comes along with it. And sometimes you have to work to figure out what that applied domain should be. Um, and so we might ask ourselves, all right, um, 
Two numbers. So let's say real numbers. Fine, right? We're doing calculus. They should be real numbers. Um, are there any restrictions that we should place on this? Well, in principle, no. But if we think a little bit about, well, we want to maximize the product. We want the largest possible product, right? Um, so we certainly don't want the product to be negative. Okay. Um, so let's see. Well, if both numbers were negative, then the product will be positive. But if both numbers are negative, they can't sum to 100, right? And we don't want one to be positive and one to be negative, because if one is positive and one is negative, then the product's negative and we don't have a maximum. Um, so that seems to suggest that, well, x and y should both be bigger than or equal to 0. Um, and, but if x and y are both bigger or equal to 0, and we want the sum to be 100, right? Two non-negative numbers adding to 100. Uh, we also know that x and y have to be less than or equal to 100. And suddenly we do have a domain. x should be between 1 and 100. Okay? And like any of these extreme value problems, right, you get a continuous function on a closed interval, we should check the endpoints. But what we find is that at either endpoint, the product is zero. Probably not our maximum, right? OK, so we know the maximum is not going to occur at an endpoint, so it must be at a critical number. How do we find critical numbers? We take the derivative. We set it equal to zero. 100 minus 2x, so 2 times 50 minus x, OK? So p prime at 50 equals 0. That's our only critical number. So in this case, because we have a continuous function, closed interval, one critical number, and we've already checked the endpoints, we can be confident that our maximum must occur at 50, right? So the max is going to be. Um, p equals 50 times 50, which is 2,500. And it, it sort of makes sense that the maximum is, is going to occur when the two values are equal. Um, right? There's some sort of symmetry involved there. Um, now, if you aren't convinced that this has to be the maximum because there's no other possibility, right? Um, we, we, we know this already. We know that the maximum has to occur at an endpoint or a critical point. We've ruled out the endpoints, so it must be the critical point, right? But if you're still if you're still not sure, there's one other thing we can do. We give ourselves a little sign chart, right? And we say, okay, for p prime, if x is bigger than 50, this is negative. If it's less than 50, it's positive. So we're going from increasing to decreasing. So yes, indeed, that's a maximum, right? You can always verify with the first derivative test. Or, or if you want, you could even go to the second derivative test, right? The second derivative is going to be minus 2, always negative. So we know it's a max.